Welcome to the fourth episode of BAA Talks. My name is Naim Benjamin Bauer. I am the founder and the managing director of our aviation advisory and newly established consulting firm, exclusively working for the aviation industry. Today is my great pleasure to have Arya Saka as our special guest today. So welcome here. It's a very great pleasure to have you here. Now I would like to ask you, can you tell me more about you as a person? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Linus. Thank you so much for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. So my name is Aya Sadr. Uh, I'm the founder of Bolt. Bolt is the newest, um, I would say, agency for entrepreneurship in MENA. What we're doing is we are creating hackathons, uh, workshops, as well as accelerator programs for corporate partners as well as public sector partners. And our intention is to bring in the new age of entrepreneurship to the region. Uh, I've worked previously with a couple of big partners like Google and Techstars, and what I've tried to do is advance the models uh, that uh, really worked globally and try to localize them here in this market, and then hopefully expand out uh, beyond the UAE to the entire MENA region. Yeah, it's very inspiring uh, to have people like you in aviation as well, and we many appreciate as well uh, to have an uh, inspiring woman be part of the aviation landscape as well. So when we are going more into your personal insights, um, can you maybe tell us where did you get the kind of entrepreneurial spirit? Yeah, sure. So uh, I'm a graduate of Babson College. Uh, Babson has been rated um, ranked number one entrepreneurship school in the world for uh, almost 20 years now. So do two decades in a row. Uh, with a lot of support from the international community to keep this uh, entrepreneurial spirit alive as well. Uh, while I was studying there, uh, you don't really have an option other than to graduate with an entrepreneurship degree <laughs> because it's embedded within every single course. Mm -hmm. And uh, having met so many amazing, inspiring entrepreneurs around the world, uh, it was just, you know, when I came back to Dubai, I, I immediately wanted to work with my family business. But, you know, when you... I would say taste entrepreneurship. It's really hard to go back and work in a, in a corporate job or to work in a brick and mortar type of business. So I really, um, you know, I started from zero when I came back to Dubai and I built my way up uh, in the landscape of, of entrepreneurship. So I would say definitely the spirit did come from my studies, uh, but also from my father, who is an entrepreneur himself uh, and also built his business from scratch. So, you know, when, when I look at my dad and he's, you know, enjoying his life and he's, you know, making, let's say, very useful relationships with people, mm -hmm. it's really inspiring to be a woman as well, to, to have the opportunity to also go into his foot, to follow his footsteps. So I think one thing um, that I would definitely say is the combination of, of a great uh, education, as well as inspiring role models around me constantly. It really was a no-brainer that I wanted to follow, uh, follow in his footsteps and, and become an entrepreneur myself. Yeah, maybe I'm talking about uh, you be the public speaker as well. Uh, how did you gain that kind of confidence uh, to become public speaker speaking in front of hundreds or thousands of people in some case? How did you build that kind of confidence and did other people play part in the whole to contribute into this, or just tell us how did you get that? Sure. Um, well, it was a bit of an obsession, right? So I, uh, my first public speaking experience was horrible. Um, <laughs> I remember standing on uh, in front of, I, was, I think it was just a classroom. It was about 50, uh, 60 people sitting there, and I came up and I started to present. I didn't prepare. I, I mumbled, and I just walked out. And I, I always repeat the story to students because I want them to understand that what starts off as really bad can turn into something really great. But it's the persistence and I would say the consistency on working on something that's really going to get you to your goal eventually. So I did uh, two things. I asked a lot of my teachers to support me after class uh, in, in teaching me how to public speak. And the second thing was I watched a lot of TEDx videos. Um, I know it sounds kind of cliche, but... You know, the best way to really become passionate about something is to watch people who are being passionate while doing it. So it's, it's really interesting when, when you watch a lot of TEDx speakers, they always have such an incredible story to tell. In my opinion, I, th I still think that in the future I would do one more TEDx or maybe more than that 
but it would definitely be around life experiences. A lot of what I shared in the past was about the future, about technologies, uh, about uh, startups. But what I really want to focus on in my eventual TEDx is talking about my life story. So I think public speaking really started off for me as, you know, this is an opportunity to really challenge the things that I was weak at and to become better at it. Um, but then I, I started to really enjoy it. And that's when I think opportunities speaking in front of 2,500 people in Rome on stage, you know, that, that, uh, that came up. So those are, um, let's say, the eventual uh, benefits of, of really pursuing my weakness and turning it into a strength. Yeah, that is very inspiring, and uh, we all know everything is uh, learning by doing. Mm-hmm. We learn from the mistake and make it better of this uh, in the personal life or in the career life. Uh, that is all these things uh, which are shape us to the future. Yeah. So before we come more or digging deeper into aviation, I would like to ask you, uh, based on your introduction and based on what you have said so far, uh, we come to the conclusion you have um, developed an illustrious career, a center about uh, supporting entrepreneurs and startups. But can you maybe tell us uh, how did you fall into aviation? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, so when you work with startups, you work with startups across every industry, right? So you work with fintech and health tech and, and edutech, and aviation was something that always remained a mystery, right? Um, having grown up in Dubai, I would say Emirates Airline being the best airline in the world, um, voted by many publications, many newspapers, many editorials worldwide. You know, it, it was always a point of interest for me to see how do you turn this giant, I would say this, you know, this big bear into something entrepreneurial. So, you know, we always say that the slowest people in the industry are the, are the biggest uh, corporations. And... There was an opportunity to basically walk in and, and you know, start creating a test bed for innovation there uh, with, with Emirates Airline and their partners. And a lot of the feedback from the community was not great, right? There was rumors that we were greenwashing, that we were doing things that were not going to be great for the startups, and we were just doing it for show. So I remember I set out on a journey and I, I asked my team, I said, if you trust me to really build an innovation culture for you, You need to allow for me to do what I want and trust that I will deliver for you that innovation that you're really looking for. And today, Intilak, which is the aviation hub that we developed uh, around travel and tourism, is globally known. People around the world speak about Intilak. So we have Propeller Shannon, we have Hangar 51, we have all the big guys that were basically there before us now working with us uh, at a global level. We have startups coming from Israel, from Berlin, from um, from New York, from, from all over the world. And the objective is, I want to show Emirates Airline that my startup idea is innovative enough for them to actually POC with, right? to create that proof of concept um, with that startup. So I think what's really incredible is, you know, we started with an idea, but in order for us to really pursue it in an entrepreneurial way, I was invited in to do that for them. Versus building it within the company and getting stuck in the politics and the, the barriers that, you know, genuinely exist and still exist, mm. right? So they brought me from outside to come in and really overlook all of that and say, build innovation for us. How can you do it? So I think it was a really great challenge for me to enter aviation. I learned a lot from some of the best people in the industry. Ahmed Safa, head of engineering, uh, Ad Rada, the COO of Emirates Airline. You're sitting with some of the most incredible minds and you're challenging the status quo um, and you're presenting to them. So the opportunity to really execute on something was taken very seriously all the way up to His Highness Sheikh Ahmed bin Saeed al Maktoum, also looking at some of these projects that we had developed. So I think the power became in the network that was interested in these ideas. So that was my, I say, my journey over the course of four years in aviation. Yeah, it was uh, indeed a very exciting, of course, a challenging journey as well, but at the end of the day, it has paid off to be part of aviation as well. And when we are looking back at the past 10 years, we have seen an uh, ultimately crowd of the entire aviation industry. But right now, we are dealing with the COVID-19 issue, 
Eng, äh, der Engteil der Mittel ist, ich bin kompromiss bei Covid-19, also man kann mich zu erwischen, mit der äh, Hauptsportliste, mit der Kongestivität, tut du bei Ada äh, Airports in der Kalf. Äh, how will you characterize the impact on aviation by COVID-19? Yeah, I mean, definitely we've slowed a lot of things down in 2020, right? It's, I remember in February I told my mom when, when COVID-19 was starting, I said, I promise you this year is going to go down in history. And it, it's incredible because it, it actually is definitely going to go down in history. If not, we're going to remove 2020 entirely from, <laughs> from history. Um, I think what's really amazing is During this time when people slowed down, there was a lot of reflection. Reflection on an individual level, reflection on a corporate level, and reflection on a public sector level. I think the efforts that the UAE had done, I would say, if we compare it globally, right, we were really prepared for something to happen. And if we talk to some of the C-level uh, executives at uh, Dubai Health Authority, you know, they spoke on stage at the AI uh, Everything Summit, And they were saying that, you know, Dubai was really in a position to take such a challenge and actually make it into uh, something that we could really deal with. Um, and I think they were very proactive in terms of having the right amount of beds, having access to a great healthcare facility across the entire country. Uh, we have great communication with the other Emirates in order for us to be able to, to deal with such a challenge. Now, when it came to the public sector, And when it came to the corporates that were, you know, fighting to keep just their, I would say, their employees alive. Uh, and, and when I say alive, I mean just still working with them, right? And we had budget slashes. We had uh, a lot of different people having to, you know, go back to their country um, where they had come from. And we know that with an 85% expat population here in the UAE, you know, there was a lot of challenges presented across industry. The question that always came up was who survived and why, right? So I, I had a conversation with um, Mahmoud Adi and, and Ibrahim Tadros, both uh, really notable entrepreneurs in, in the startup ecosystem. And, you know, I remember asking Ibrahim specifically, you know, how is your wife's salon doing? So she has this beautiful salon in, in the Palm. And he said, you know, we, we survived. And we had to prepare for every situation that was going to come up. And we had to be positive and we had to think, okay, do I cut my losses right now and sink my business? Or do I stick around and, and wait for things to get better? And the beautiful thing is that when you're an entrepreneur, you understand that you're not building for the moment that your business is going to do well. You're building for the moment that your business is going to sink. And those are the entrepreneurs that really make it through difficult times. So I think what's really amazing is you look at aviation and every time somebody says aviation, they say, oh, the poor guys, you know, look at, look at that industry. It got really hit. But I don't think so. I think we really are fighters. I think when we look at the aviation industry, people are fanatics. People will go, but they will come back. I know so many executives, so many employees that left five years later, returned back to the industry. And the reason for that is because it's a very special one. I don't know if it was the Wright brothers really creating, you know, that passion behind mm -hmm. this industry, but I think it really is amazing to see the resilience of people. And it's also amazing to hear some of the stories, uh, which I'll share with you in a bit on some of the successes from COVID-19 as well. Yeah, we always, always say every single crisis is leading to new opportunities. Mm -hmm. And in this case, it's applied to aviation as well. Right now we have the opportunity to reshape the entire aviation industry for the future in the more sustainable way. So when we are talking about this, uh, you know, some people have say the pandemic, for example, has accelerated the digitalization and the innovation of uh, the entire aviation industry. So from your point of view, do you see many opportunities out there for startups disrupting and innovate the aviation for tomorrow? Definitely. Definitely. I mean, we have to be prepared for COVID-20, right? I think that's sort of the joke uh, these days. Well, it's not very funny, but I think one thing that we can definitely agree on is, you know, what do consumers want? When we build products, when we build services, what are we doing? We're building things that people uh, necessarily need, right? This is what we're basically building for in the future. Um, now, when we think about, I would say, the challenges that are coming up, 
uh, around the future, we have to understand that there's always going to be challenges. But what we're trying to do very well is understand what our customers need. That is the only definite. That is how we're basically going to shape the future of our businesses. So during this time, I would take an example of Dubes. Uh, Dubes were acquired by Donata uh, after one year of acceleration with, with Intilac. And in my opinion, that business goes down in history in terms of how amazing uh, their story is. Because Emirates Airline has never looked at a startup younger than eight years old. Right. And when we say startup, they're not a startup at eight years, right? They are a full functional business that broke even probably a few years back. Um, now you take dupes, right? Their job is basically to go to your house, pick up your bags and deliver it to the airport. And the whole point is that you have no touch points. You don't have to talk to any executives. Uh, you don't have, sorry, you don't have to talk to any, um, employees at Emirates airline. You basically have your bag sent to the airport and it checks in. That's, that's their, um, that was, I would say the scope of their work. When they started off, Donata had acquired them, but the problem was they couldn't check in any of the Emirates bags. And Emirates actually had gone ahead and done it with a separate business, which I will not say the name of. During the pandemic, imagine Emirates came and said, Dubes, we want to work with you guys as well. Because they know the value. They know that the guys understand this business better than them and their partners. And they're going to do it at the best cost as well. And it's going to be good for the airline. That was one thing that I would say that was incredible from the startup side. The second one was, how do we get people to also do their PCR test at home, get the results, have their bags checked in as well? Now, what you're basically doing is you're increasing your revenue um, by a little bit because you're also adding in the cost of the PCR test on the, on the customer. And what you're doing is you're encouraging them to fly with having a, a secure PCR test, a secure check-in for their bag, and an overall happiness, I would say, increase in their, in their ability to travel, right? So they really shaped their business model around supporting um, people who wanted to travel during this time. And I think that's one, I would say, one of the greatest things that this business was able to do during this time is listen to their customer, understand what can I do to make your lives easier and better? And that's, that's an example of a startup that I'd say really swung the bat in, uh, in COVID-19. Yeah, I found it agree with your point uh, on the customer-centric approach that we need to understand the customer needs and the preference better. And uh, the entire customer journey has to be also redefined and reshaped with the help of the entire ecosystem below aviation. So when we are looking into this direction, uh, it is all about gaining the confidence to travel again. How do you see the importance of accelerators or incubators mm -hmm. uh, in contributing to the increase of air travel competence? Definitely. I think it's, it's, um, it's very important for us to understand that startups can move a lot faster than corporates. The reason for that is because they have smaller teams, they're more agile, they're more flexible. They understand how to create a better dynamic for everyone. And they're constantly talking to their customers, right? I don't want to say that the big airlines get lazy, but the thing is, it's not their priority as much, right? Their priority switches into things like branding, right? And marketing that they are the best. But what startups do really well is they try to understand what are customers craving for now? What are they craving for tomorrow? How can we build that? How can we test that, right? So at Bolt, for example, we have a methodology that is build, operate, learn, and test, right? And that's really based on thousands of entrepreneurs kind of coming through either an accelerator program I've worked on or built or um, a hackathon that I've been engaged in. And a lot of what I try to understand as well is how do we shape that type of methodology around supporting entrepreneurs? Um, but, you know, going back to the, I would say the, the main uh, crux of it, these entrepreneurs that are building, I would say, the confidence back in passengers traveling tomorrow is because they're trying to accommodate for the weakest touch points that the customers are experiencing now and turning those into a strength. And how they basically do that, if I give the example again of dupes, right? A lot of uh, passengers were, were a bit, I would say, stuck between, okay, I have to go get my PCR test and I have to check in my bag and then it's too much movement. I feel like, you know what? I don't need to travel now. What they're really doing is creating that comfort layer around saying, you're going to go from point A to point B and we will help you in the most simple and safe way possible, right? So that's a great example of, of one a business. Now, think about Dubai Duty Free. Suffered a lot during the pandemic, right? 
they're basically a retail store that didn't have any customers. So we take an example of a company called Bonflight, um, who Hung Bo's is the CEO of. And, you know, they went through Antilak, I would say, a year or two ago. And today, Emirates Airline invited them back to do a proof of concept, which is a very powerful thing because they see the need for people to stop shopping in the physical stores, but to just go in and actually purchase uh, some of these items and get it sent to them at their destination. Now, you take the example of these guys who are basically innovating in this crisis, and the first thing that comes to mind is, okay, there is an opportunity for us to understand that Dubai Duty Free cannot do that on their own, right? They're not, that's not their core business. But take a company like Bonflight, who can really save the day in terms of offering that to the Dubai Duty Free in a seamless capacity and to offer um, an agreement that works for both parties. So, you know, it's, it's startups like, like these during this time that can really support uh, the industry and, and support customers as well. Yeah, uh, maybe about the uh, pandemic and COVID-19. Uh, it has made the foundation or increased the importance of having partners on your side, mm -hmm. specializing in several areas yeah. to make basically your life easier mm -hmm. and to maintain your focus on other areas. In the meantime, we are start up are taking care of your parts of the business. Mm -hmm. I think maybe we are talking about now back to the another topic, uh, be the female innovation. Mm -hmm. uh, you have enjoyed a very successful career as public speaker, and you are one of the drivers of the Dubai uh, startup ecosystem, speak, specifically for aviation as well, as a movement specifically in the Middle East. Who has been your biggest inspiration? Did mm. you look up in uh, a specific woman or who was your main inspiration to become somebody like you today? I mean, there's a lot of women that are I find to be very inspiring. Um, I think one thing is maybe being when you have a, a, a more strong per personality, you do definitely look towards the women who are strong but soft. Right. Um, I would definitely say um, Rania Rustum, who is the chief innovation officer at GE, who I had the pleasure of working with um, during my time at Intilak. Um, the first time I saw her on stage, I was in awe. You know, I, I just kept thinking, what a powerful but eloquent woman who has such incredible value to offer uh, in terms of the information she was sharing with everybody. And I remember the first time I saw her in person, uh, I, I told her about how much I admire her confidence uh, and that I would love to, to learn more from her as, as we got to work on Intilak. And she really was a huge support for me and still is. Um, fortunately, she is one of the advisors in my life that I get to uh, speak to quite often. So I think, you know, really surrounding yourself with people who know what they want and people who are very confident in, in understanding what they can offer um, and how to do it in the right way as well. So I think, you know, I would say definitely Rani Rustam is a huge support, especially on the aviation side when I was working with Intilak. Um, I can name a few others. I, I would even go back to the entrepreneurship ecosystem and quote uh, Najla al -Midfa, right? So Najla al -Midfa, I'm sure we're all aware of her. She is the head of Shira. And also a very strong Emirati woman who is very open-minded and has a lot, I would say, she gives back to the community, not just to women, but to men as well. And she's very, very well respected across uh, the industry. So I think it's, it's very important to understand that that confidence, that attraction point you have to a person is because they are so comfortable being themselves. That's where, that's where I would say a, a guiding light comes from. And it's that ability to know that whatever you're doing, it's, it's not because you're forcing it, it's because it feels really great to do it. And I think those are the types of women that I really admire in any industry, to be honest with you. And, but those two specifically, because I've had the pleasure of working with them. Yeah, so maybe we are talking about the uh, startup landscapes. Uh, maybe we are looking at other industry like healthcare industry or mm -hmm. cosmetics and uh, fashion. We see a lot of women be involved in startup as founder or as CEO. But when we are looking at the uh, startup landscape innovation, we see a lot of startups are found among banal mm -hmm. mm -hmm. In your opinion, uh, what should be done 
in order to get more movement, in order to convince the movement to become the CEO and the founder of startups in aviation, mm. which is the very heavy male dominated industry yeah. today. Well, that's a, that's a very good question, right? Uh, the question we also have to ask ourselves sometimes is why are more men drawn towards aviation, right? Is it because there are more men there? There are more stories about incredible men? Is it because there is a, a genuine interest in engineering more from the male side? Is it because men are less afraid to fail, right? There's a lot of questions around this that I would say become a little bit philosophical, right? People always lean towards, I would say, the acad on the academic side, towards the things that they're comfortable with, right? Um, I remember there's a very powerful TEDx uh, that I watched talking about how, you know, one, one woman was teaching a coding class and half the class were women and the other class were men. She went around, she's looking at everybody's laptop and she stopped at one of the girls. And she said, open your screen for me. And it was blank. And they had been in the class for 30 minutes. So she said, why is your screen blank? And she said, I just, I'm not sure if I'm doing it right. She pressed control Z about 40 times. And she realized that the woman had been coding and coding and deleting and coding and deleting and coding and deleting. And she said, why, why don't you just put something out there and, and let's just test with it? And she said, I want it to be perfect. Perfect doesn't exist, but good is better than perfect. And a lot of people really miss out on this. And a lot of women as well strive for perfection. But just doing it should be the philosophy that we teach young girls. And when it comes to engineering, it comes to coding, there's a lot of failure involved, right? There's this fear that we are creating for women that if they're not perfect, then it's not good enough. We really need to reverse that culturally, especially in the Middle East. And this ability to feel that a woman is in control of her decisions, right? That comes from building her confidence. More often than less, a woman is told that she's not good enough to do something, right? Versus men, who we keep telling to keep doing it over and over again. It's a cultural problem. So when we look at people going towards specific, I would say, academic areas, it's not, a, it's not I would say, a coincidence. A lot of it is this ability to understand that you can fail at something, but if you try and you try and you try, you keep falling, you'll eventually get up and you will learn how to walk by yourself. I think this is one of the biggest things that I would say, I was born into a house where women and men were exactly the same. We were both given the opportunity to fail as much as possible. So I think this is the type of thing that I would love to push more women to do. That's why I believe in women in STEM. That's why I push for hackathons so more women can get out there. Because it's important for us to understand that failure is good. Not trying is wrong. Okay, uh, maybe I'll talk more about the future of aviation. Uh, where do you see the technology and the startup play the very important role mm -hmm. for contributing to aviation? If you see any specific areas, might be security, might be safety, mm -hmm. might be commercial, operational, where do you see the greater importance of technology and startups in the future? Definitely. I think right now what's top of mind on the marketing side, if we were to gather enough information from people, it's safety, right? A lot of the times we're hearing stories from people that they flew to their parents, they took COVID-19 with them and they infected them, right? Um, and a lot of people are just worried that if I'm about to travel, am I going to infect somebody else, right? The idea that you're going to get it in the air, I remember you shared an article saying that less than 1% actually you know, can contract COVID-19 in the skies. It's usually when you're coming from a certain destination or once you're, you've arrived in another destination and you've contracted it somehow. So I think it's really important for us to get a lot of startups to start thinking, how do we increase, let's say, the safety in the minds of, of passengers so that they can start to fly again? So I think a lot of startups are going to be focusing really heavily on that, however they can, right? So I would say one of the coolest innovations we saw in the middle of the pandemic um, amongst many others, but, but this one is specific, maybe because I'm a woman, but it was basically this thing where you spray onto a surface and as soon as you spray onto it, it completely clears of, of any bacteria that's on the, on the surface. And it, it does that for approximately 24 hours. 
So I think there's there's incredible innovation that's happening that we're sort of seeing in different parts of the world that can really support um, and gaining regaining the confidence of people. So imagine spraying that on the surface in the plane uh, before passengers come on board. So I would say that the one area that um, we can definitely look at, apart from the innovation of spraying a surface and, and creating it bacteria free, another area would be definitely in terms of, if we look at dubs again, you know, delivering your bags to the airport, things that are basically going to re reduce the friction um, on the travel customer journey. It's funny because when we started Intilac, the first um, marketing message we had was, how can we make aviation travel, uh, sorry, how can we make travel better, simpler, or more exciting? Right, those were the three metrics that we were looking at back then. Uh, and they've since then introduced uh, Dubai Future Foundation's Emirates Airline um, vertical. Um, and then we also introduced the Aviation X Lab which had incredible partners on board like Boeing and Talis and sorry Airbus and Talis and GE and Collins Aerospace. So you know we're really talking about the moonshots at this point around what are what's going to be the future solutions. So if you talk to Airbus some of the biggest points of interest for them was you know how do we reduce carbon emissions? Although we all know that you know in the sphere of uh, reducing carbon emissions actually we are not the biggest contributors but um I can't name them because they might watch this, but, <laughs> but basically there are other players in the industry that, uh, that create that problem. But what we're looking at is how do we reduce our part? How can aviation really be a better contributor for the world? Um, and I think it's confidence uh, restoring for the people to, to start flying again, but it's also really focusing again on our goals. What are the things that, that aviation has to focus on on the moonshot level, but also at the at travel customer journey level as well? So I think it's really amazing when we when you look at open innovation challenges versus very targeted ones, you're going to see incredible innovation on all sides. But what's really important, and I think what's what's a great investment from Emirates' side, is looking at the moonshots. What are really going to be the future questions that we have around aviation, uh, and how do we tackle them? So everything from cybersecurity, of course, yes. How do we make sure that people are safe when they travel? Um, how can we ensure that people are are also Let's say maintaining social distancing. How how do we ensure that people are, um, you know, again, it's it's not like with a disease on board that everything else has gone away, right? So like terrorism attacks, right? So these are things that we still need to prepare people for, and that's what we really need to, need to prepare our internal teams for, is how do we deal with all types of uh, problems. So um, I would say definitely. And what's coming next is making sure that, yes, we are focusing on the problems that are in the next five years, but on the moonshot level, let's really focus on what's going to happen in the next 50. Let's really prepare for anything that can come in the future. And that's something that Dubai does and has always done, is, uh, is really prepare for tomorrow and what's going to come next. When we are talking about the circulation of the fucking from neck here on in many parts of the world, um, we now, some countries have been discussing uh, how the future of air travel might look like, mm -hmm. how the future of the reopening of the borders might look like. Mm -hmm. And that is something uh, which is going to the direction of biosecurity to obtain the health data of potentials mm -hmm. in addition to the data of the potential general data. Um, how do you see the future of the startup ecosystem or the landscape uh, in terms of biosecurity for aviation? Hmm. That's a great question. I think one thing that we can definitely rely on is cross-pollination of information. The startup ecosystem is very connected from Dubai to San Francisco to Berlin to wherever you want in the world. It's incredible to see how fast we can share information on certain things that are happening. And I think one thing that we're definitely going to look at in the next coming, uh, I would say, years, is who's going to come up with the best innovation and how can we spread that across the globe as fast as possible, right? So when we talk about biosecurity, we are really going to be focusing on the best R&D labs in the world that are going to be tackling these questions and then seeing how we can then localize it in different markets as fast as possible. Why startups are important is because of speed, flexibility, agility, the ability to connect the dots as fast as possible everywhere. So I think one thing that we're going to be seeing over the course of the next few years is some of the best minds in the world tackling these types of problems and trying to come up with as many solutions as possible and seeing what's really going to stick at a consumer level. An idea is 
nothing without commercialization. So I think it's really important for us to involve, I would say, the human and all these elements around these questions that we're trying to tackle. So it's about seeing who's really going to come up with the best idea and implement and test it as fast as possible for us to see if this is going to be something that works. Yeah, that is a, a very important topic, which has to be addressed to the entire aviation system as well, uh, in order to move forward into the future mm -hmm. and make air travel safe and secure again mm -hmm. for airlines, for protections, for airports, and even for the governments of the countries. So when we are coming to the final question of the, the session, um, we have seen a lot of other industries like car manufacturing or healthcare industries. They have been working very closely in a lot of startups. They have a very strong solar startup ecosystem, mm -hmm. very well built over the last 10 years. But when it comes to aviation, from my point of view, we are somehow missing some parts or we are not having a very proper startup ecosystem. Uh, so what would be the priorities for airlines, airports and suppliers and even the governments and the startups to move forward into the future to build up a very big, so like an efficient startup ecosystem? Hmm. I think when we, if we zone in just into aviation, right, and yeah. travel, I think it's very important for us to understand, you know, why are we not there yet? Why are we not able to really connect the dots globally? Which is ironic because of the point of a plane is to travel all over the world, right? Um, I think the one thing that we need to understand is, are we investing enough into R&D, right? And are we able to turn around things quick enough? So if we look at the regulations in the aviation industry, it's very strict. Things cannot happen within the course of one year or six months. If to get uh, any approval to come by, it takes about 10 years, right? So we have to go through many testing uh, opportunities to be able to really solidify whether something is good or not, uh, good enough to even go up in the air. Ima imagine COVID-19 had to go through the aviation regulation. We would be 10 years waiting at home trying to decide whether or not <laughs> we are going to be able to, to do anything. So I think it's really important for us to really get the regulators on board and to reduce the testing time around many questions. I think if we really want to be able to have a more innovative aviation uh, industry, then we need to start involving all the stakeholders simultaneously, from the regulators to the private companies, um, to the government entities, to the passengers as well. Getting all the different stakeholders to really communicate on a more frequent basis, right? I do, I do definitely think we have a lot of, um, in terms of the infrastructure to be able to allow for us all to communicate together, is it's, th it's there. But the question is, if we want to get to a point of innovation, we need to start really investing in that a lot, heavily, a lot more heavily. If we look at countries like China versus the UAE, right? China has a huge opportunity to start innovating further. But the problem is, it's such a top-down approach. Whereas here in the UAE, we're doing it in the opposite direction. We're trying to involve everybody from the point at the bottom to go up. So I think it's really important to understand as well, culturally, when we talk about aviation, every single country is dealing with it in a different way. How do we really standardize that approach? How do we get that communication layer to go across the globe in a way that helps and benefits everybody? Because at the end of the day, if I'm traveling from Dubai to China, I'm coming back from China to Dubai. So we need to think about how we're creating that cross-collaboration and that cross-country collaboration in a way that helps everyone. Yeah, that is a very important point you mentioned. Uh, it's all about the culture, it's all about the people. In order to gain the efficiency and make things happen, we need to come closer because we are living on the same planet. And uh, that is the biggest change now, right now, because of COVID-19 as well, uh, to make the world a better world for everyone, including aviation as well. Aria, it was a very great pleasure having you here. Yes. It was very inspiring to hear your stories and to learn more about uh, the startup ecosystem innovation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Linus. Thanks for having me.